Welcome back to Good Vibes with Vibe. I'm very excited to be doing this in person with my friend Gabo Aurora to talk about his latest project, Paradise, and all of the backstories. Gabo, how's the baby? Great. Very, very cute. 15 months. Same age as my oh. newest one. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So it's a very, well, what a weird time to have figured out. To have, well, we just kind of happened to us. What a blessing in disguise, it's too, blessed, that we yeah. get to spend time with our babies while yeah. working more and having more time in our hands. Yeah. Very and special memories. We named him Phoenix. What, what's the name of your child? Athena, the Athena. goddess warrior. Well, so kind of uh, Roman vibes. Yes. I mean, not Roman, but like ancient. Goddess. Goddess, goddess energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Phoenix, wow, okay. Yeah. I think Phoenix. Um, rising from the ashes. Rising from the ashes. Does it have any connotation in, in Asian culture, the phoenix? That too, yeah. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. What, what? It's actually more along the lines of good luck. Oh, yeah. That's um, nice. Yeah, glory. Yeah. Yeah. Glory. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Power, so, money, glory. Well, so that, that's a separate <laughs> conversation. I'm really excited to catch up with yeah, Baba thank Aurora you. today. Thank you. Um, because it's been a while. What a yeah. weird two, three years it's yeah. been. Last time we got to hang out together and party into the night for a good cause was at Davos 2018. Yeah. 2018, where we launched VR for Impact. Yeah. We showcased the last goodbye at the World Food Program with the United Nations at Davos, freezing outside, avalanche notice every day. Um, That did not deter our burning passion to show this piece of amazing technology to tell the most important stories of our time. So Gabo, clearly you are a multiple award-winning filmmaker. You're a pioneer in using this medium um, to tell important stories. You're now also a professor at yes. John Hopkins University. Yeah. That's new. That's a new development yeah. since we, we last hung out. And of course, your new dad, you're a founder of creative tech and production studio Lightshed that's based in Brooklyn. New York. So tell us, Gava, what are you showcasing here at South by Southwest 2022? Yeah, yeah. No, and thanks for having me on this. HCC, you know, I've I made my a lot of my work on the HCC Vive, and I think it's such a great um, technology that we've been able to use and to do things. Here, we're showcasing something that is really trying to highlight binaural audio, spatial audio, because it's such a an underrated thing in VR. I think people think about sound in a kind of secondary way. And we thought, well, what if we have something that's AI powered immersive audio that we can kind of show something that what's possible even with just your phone and what's possible by building a custom app. So that's what we have. The, the project is really, if I had to have a log line, it's couples therapy in the future. And so basically you do it as a couple. It's an app you download. It's timed. It's like a theatrical sort of thing where you have to like book tickets and make a night of it with your partner. And it's a 30 minute experience that takes you on a journey about your own relationship and takes you to a place that eventually you think about things very differently about what keeps us together or what makes us fall apart, you know? So. Why immersive audio as a medium to tell such a profound story and help people realize what it means in our relationships as, re- as it relates to couples and couples therapy? How are you using immersive binaural audio to tell that story? Yeah. So the, the story touches on you know, things related to intimate partner violence and mm. other things that have become far worse in the pandemic, uh, especially. Right. I think it's gone up. 25 to 33 percent, you know, in this time. So it's a kind of, the UN has said that it's kind of its own, there's another pandemic within a pandemic that's happening that has led this to happen all over the world where people are closed in and Mm. there's a lot of things that are really difficult. So uh, we knew that's a heavy, we do it in a way that's theatrical and um, kind of engaging because it's not, people don't want to do something related to that if they know that's what it's about. So we make it about your relationship, but then we kind of do bring in a lot of research on what kind of trainings between couples actually can make them healthier and safer in the long run. So it, we really felt that it's because it's a heavy topic, 
can't really show visuals around those things um, because it's they too, they can be disturbing. very triggering. Yeah, too yes. disturbing. And uh, but people still want agency. So I think using your voice, mm. engaging with an AI and a simulation, mm. and then feeling these sort of binaural experiences that kind of immerse you. Also, they yeah. give you a sense of presence. And we work with uh, Darkfield Radio. Um, out of the UK, who do other shows as well and are specialists in this type of sound design. And we really felt like this is the one that you could get people to kind of um, let their guard down and connect in a way they wouldn't if it was just too visual. It wasn't appropriate. And mm. so that's why I think mm. with our work in general at Lightshed, mm. for everything we do, we're just always thinking what we definitely want to do something that's never been done before. Like yeah. that's just basically the motto of the studio. It's like, we're only doing it if no one else has done it before. Like, it's just not going to work otherwise because that's what drives us. You're the pioneer. Well, also, you know, Elon Musk has said that, uh, obviously the great Elon Musk um, has said that if you try to solve hard problems, you will attract the greatest minds in the world. Yeah. And it's yeah. 100% true. Like, right. we come up with that vision and what we want to achieve and people get behind us in ways that is very, very moving and very touching because we don't have a lot of money. These are kind of projects that are not, um, they don't have the same, I think they're commercially viable. I think people are ready for them. And that's what our work has always been about. That stories that matter don't have to be boring. That they can be engaging. They can be life-changing. They can be transformational. Um, you've seen The Last Goodbye. Yeah. It's much more... They're, they have a cinematic feel to them. And I think the same thing with this. It brings in that kind of polish of it being very theatrical, very incredible design. And we just take it for these sort of topics. So we really do need the partnerships and the support. And a lot of the support you've given, Pearly, has been really uh, important to us. When I started Lightshed, that was our first contract that's event. That's right. That's right. You yeah. Know? That's right. To show yeah. um, faith in it. And we're, we're, we're continuing really because you gave us that starter chance so thank you for that it really means a lot not at all and now i understand more deeply about you know i was thinking we're at south by is gabo is showing something new with no visual what's happening and now now i'm understanding that you're trying to you're trying to challenge yourself and pushing yeah. the how to use immersion to tell stories at a different level because in some ways visual makes it that much easier and more obvious to tell a story from your perspective. Removing the visuals altogether uh, actually makes it a lot more challenging. You're leaving a lot uh, of agency to the audience yeah. to make of the experience. And sometimes it's maybe not obvious at all. People might get in and they don't understand. Um, but, but it, you're again, trying to create this new format to challenge yeah, others yeah. to and sound create a new way. Sound is very emotional. Uh, very, yeah. You know, it's really all of my even VR work or XR work has a very strong, uh, sound component, Yes, you know, and, yes. um, and on, honestly, if you turned off the sound, you wouldn't have any emotion. Yes. And, and people feel that a lot of my work is very emotional and engaging, um, you know, we've already had people cry with this one and yeah. other things happening. But yeah. I think it's, it's, again, leaning into what we always felt is that's where the story is. That's where the emotion is. That's where the testimonies are. That's where, you know, our everyday sort of experience lies. And I, I, I do, obviously, I love visuals and I love yeah. interactivity. You know, we do everything. But there was something about this that goes to the roots of... Um, what makes something great. And it really is having, you know, really strong testimonies. It, a lot, everything in there is based on real stories and research, you know, so it's a kind of docu-fiction, but a lot of it is based on, on reality. So, you know, also like, uh, so kind of aside, some of it is my personality where I like learning new things yeah. and I feel... You're curious. I'm very curious. Like, you know, in university, I was very, very, I don't want to brag, um, but you know, I, I, I have a very, I have a, I have a very high IQ and I was blessed with that. I was blessed with it. Absolutely. I, right? I went to Stuyvesant high school, um, which is like a very science nerdy high school. So I was very good at science. And when I went to university, I realized that I could just do that and be very successful at yeah, it. Yeah. But I was like, what's, what's the what's challenge? The yeah. And you know, the challenge is 
like art and philosophy and letters because I didn't feel there was a formula. It was this mysterious thing how creativity works and something is compelling. And I think that's why corporations, capitalism is always like, how do we bottle creativity and make more people creative so that we could have more innovation in our culture and society? And it's this mysterious force that has some rules. But I realized like, that's where I should put my energy to try to figure out because it felt it was more transformational. Otherwise, if I stuck to the physical sciences, I'd be making nuclear weapons, maybe. Like, what would I be doing with a physics degree, you know? Working with the army to make weapons. But, you know, that's what they do, you know? And I was like, I don't want my knowledge to do that. I want to learn new things. I want to constantly challenge. And in XR, I mean, I'm no, I'm not trying to brag. I'm the master of 360. You, you know really what I'm saying? Are. Like, you 360 really and me, we, and especially Barry's here also, who we worked with, it's like, I, our natural medium of like, we can just do that and just blow your mind all the time. But we wouldn't progress as artists. We wouldn't progress as, um, and to be honest, it, it's, yeah. it's someone, it's the XR community that's really made me realize that there are people who do that, who have cinema backgrounds, but dance backgrounds or medical backgrounds or research backgrounds. And I love that eclectic mix of how we come together. And this one is bringing together a researcher on gender-based violence for over right. 25 years right. who's been working on these issues using paper trainings or other things and wants to show more results, you know? And this experience is going to be used at Johns Hopkins Medical School and in the hospital. It's going to be tested. It's going to be measured. It's going to see what it's going to do for empathy for providers on these very important issues. And then we're going to test and figure out, you know, just in the broader public what it does, you know, because there are, um, it's a provocative piece, you know. Very. We didn't, we yeah. didn't take, we didn't play it safe, you know, in in any way. And your gobble doesn't play safe ever. <laughs> well, you're dating all the way back from to 2015 when you first made Clouds Over Sidra, the story of a Syrian refugee, a 12 year old girl. You wanted to tell the story about the Syrian refugee crisis, but not through a bystander's perspective. But you really want the viewers to go into the shoes of that 12 year old girl. And that was such a groundbreaking piece of storytelling using, at that time, what a new medium. Um, and it has some real world implications to helping raise money at an exponential rate, yeah. helping people establish empathy. Yeah. You work on that project with Chris Milk, where mm-hmm. we, we talked mm-hmm. about that, how VR is the ultimate empathy machine. Yeah. Tell us about that, that journey of how you, you mentioned how you decided to pursue art, storytelling. Um, and then, and then, what happened from that beginning of the journey to that point where you came across a- XR as the medium to that first project yeah, of yeah. Clouds Over Sidra? Yeah. Well, you know, I I was at the UN yeah. and uh, in undergrad, I ended up doing film and philosophy because I wanted okay. to challenge myself artistically and do things. And then I didn't really pursue that as as much because, um, you know, it was 1999 when I graduated from NYU and I went to LA. And I tried to make it in the industry yeah. and I, I yeah. failed. I failed miserably. I failed spectacularly. I don't even want to go into like how badly I failed and depressed I was by it. And so then I just thought, you know, let me just do some meaningful work. And I started working yeah. in after school programs with NGOs. And that kind of led me. And then 9 11 happened and I was like, oh, I really need to like yeah. forget about this artistic thing. Yeah. I'm going to work on policy matters. I'll work at the UN. Right. Which I ended up doing, you know, full time from 2009 to about 2017. And while I was there, about 2014, I had had a, a baby, my first son. Yeah. He was now 10. Right. Um, and I basically had a very high powered job at the UN. And I basically said, is this it? I had a midlife crisis, basically. And I basically said, where would my creativity be and how would it work? And I basically, um, I met Barry, who was here. Barry was a wedding photographer for my... <laughs> that's how, that's, that's yeah, how he came together. Yeah, yeah. So he was basically trying... Uh, Barry had worked... Um, well, he'd, he'd been in the Peace Corps in Senegal making movies for social impact. Yeah. So he knew I worked at the UN and he had this like strange idea that he would do my wedding for very free to then impress me and then try to get a job at the UN. And it worked. It did. It works. And I, was, I remember just like him taking pictures of me and with my wife. You know, you know it's, like, it's like the reception. And he just starts pitching me. Right. Yeah, like in that very American way. 
that you know you just like nothing is sacred and you just basically pitch away at any moment what you know, a hustler so so i was impressed and i just said wait a minute maybe through this guy i could revive my filmmaking you know maybe because i felt like at that point i'd been in the field of the un i had i had a deep love for the stories and people yeah. and everything that i had encountered on my way and i always felt like the media wasn't representing like people well like they were just essentializing what a refugee is, what an African is, what a Middle Easterner, you know, like there are all these stereotypes that are ingrained in us that are very harmful, you yeah. know, and, and have policy implications. So I basically said, why don't we start using new media? Maybe we start with a YouTube video. Maybe we do some things on social media. And, and I, I, I worked with Barry and revived that. And we had some very good initial successes. Mm. That then made me aware of what virtual reality was. Yeah. And then I said, without even doing it, without even ever doing it, I just said, that's it. That's the thing for me. I just knew. Just from, like, without the exp- trying the art. Well, I, I was starting to hear rumors that's really good. Okay. And I hadn't done a demo, but, okay. but this was 2014. Yeah. Right? Cardboard. Uh, well, Samsung Gear. Gear. Okay. Mostly yeah. Is, yeah. is the thing. And I don't know if I could mention other, Absolutely. other brands. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, Samsung Gear, yeah. um, basically, um, I didn't even do it. And then I basically was like, this is the thing and I'm going to do it. And now I'm going to use all of my power and influence to get into the room with someone from Samsung. Like I just, if I tell them, and my idea was basically, let's do this in a refugee, cause the refugee crisis was really not doing well, but it wasn't like in the public imagination yet. And I said, let's do something in a refugee camp. Let's try to like, just figure this out and we just bring people there. I always felt when I'd come back from mission and have dinner in New York, have you ever seen this movie, My Dinner with Andre? I really recommend everyone to see it. It's basically like people would look at me like I was crazy or something. Like I was trying to like explain, but then I realized I had this tool now where I could just take them there. You don't need to explain. You know, I don't need, they it wasn't this report, it. these pictures. Right. I could like, they could actually, they could talk to them. Yeah. And they could have dinner with them. Right. They could engage with them, sit in school with them. Yeah. And that's what the whole idea was that I, it was really my frustration um, coming back to New York and not being able to express what I felt was so magical about people all over the world. And I really felt we saw them as um, poor victims, but really their resilience, their strength. Um, we don't have a, a, a pinky of that, of that courage and strength that they have sometimes. And we really should be showcasing that and like right. what it is. So right. I basically, through my connections, realized um, that I'd worked with Bono and the one yeah. uh, campaign. Right. And Bono and I had bonded because he really likes Queens. I'm originally from Queens. And because there's a lot of Irish in Queens. It's a weird sort of connection with being Irish in Queens. And also Spider-Man's from Queens. The Ramones are from Queens. Like he's a little bit of like a Queens fanatic. And I mm. grew up in Queens, New York. Um, you know, with the nanny. No, I'm joking. No, <laughs> <laughs> so but, many different ways to bond with the person. Yeah. So, so basically, he he invited me to. He had invited me to a party for his um, album that then went on on everyone's phone and it's still there, which is really embarrassing. That was what the party was for for that album. And he basically then said, like, through at that thing, I pitched them the idea because I thought someone they'd introduced me to someone from Samsung, and they said, well we were going to do this project and Chris Milk was there. Uh, you should like talk. And he, the edge, the guitarist connected me in person to Chris. And Chris said, I've been waiting for you my whole life. He was like, cause Chris has been working in VR yeah. for, for a couple of years then. Right. And he says, like, I've been saying like, there's like something more here, but I just don't know how to do it. Um, and he was like, he just was like, it's like, I've always thought that's a great idea. And so he gave me his card and as soon as I exited that night, I was at a sushi place with some friends or something. You know, you're in diplomat life, as you can imagine. And then basically, I got this long email from him, like saying, would you like to do a demo tomorrow? And so then he gave me a demo with his Oculus DK2 set and a laptop. And it was his Beck Sound and Vision music video. It just blew my mind. I just was like, this is it. Floored. This is a fusion. It's totally floored. Yeah. And then... I, I said, yeah, if you, if you give me the camera and train me, I got a guy, Barry. Uh, we'll, we'll go and get footage and we'll make something great happen. Right. And we did that in 2014 and then we showed it 
at Davos in 2015, and then at Sundance, and really that was the that was the real that kickstarted the whole industry. Really, that's right. That was a you lot of people's really, first truly the, VR experience. That's right. And yeah, and I was very proud that it wasn't a roller coaster, it wasn't something else that people were imprinted by something very deep and beautiful and meaningful. And we were able to kind of, you know, from that, launch our journey to continue to make UNVR, do things at the UN. But then I wanted to go into Game Engine and do mm. things in a more sophisticated way with social yeah. VR. And the UN, you know, wasn't the most appropriate place because Trump had gotten elected and, the envi- you know, the kind of environment changes as you have a different administration, yeah. like what kind of support you get. Uh, and I'm a U.S. citizen, so like I wasn't going to get as much support for doing stories about Gaza or other things I like to do. Uh, and so I started my own company, Lightshed.io, and then continued to, you know, make other things that continue to make a measurable impact, but are really compelling works of art as well. What was it like when you first landed in Jordan, step into that refugee camp, met Zah- Zahar? What's her uh, name? Zatari and then- and Sidra. Sidra mm-hmm. and Zatri, and you have the 360 camera on, on you for the first time, learning to use this yeah. new language. What was that like for you? Uh, it, Were you already making films before? Well, I no? was making some films with Barry, but when I was an undergrad, I'd made other films. So, right. So there, it was different because it's a different mindset of yeah. how you, you do it. And we had 48 hours, uh, basically, as a permit. To shoot there. Yeah. So I had done a lot of research and I was really inspired by the films of Abbas Kuryastami, who's an Iranian um, film director. And a lot of Iranians work with children because that's how they're able to overcome the censors mm. because mm. they kind of tell these like fabled stories through children's stories, but really are making a commentary on, on things and, they, and they're really beautiful. So I, I thought he was some of the best sort of person and I... Um, came up with the idea that we would just do a day in the life of a young girl who's about 12, yeah. who is childlike enough that she kind of believes that she can go back home, but slowly the innocence is wearing off and she's yeah. realizing that this is the new normal for her. Yeah. And that kind of awakening in a sad way was, even though actually showing you like, I'm in school, I'm going to, you know, all these things, it was playing with like her longing for home even though she was okay like for her life you know she everything but she doesn't have a lot of that normalcy so trying to capture that inner life was really great and so we just i was at the un and we were partnering with unicef and they have amazing people on the ground who just like were like okay that's it so we're going to see this and they like really helped us kind of produce it and take us into different parts of zatri find sidra uh, interview her and, and bring her story to the world, you know, and it ended up immediately when they started using it for face-to-face fundraising or in conferences, it just doubled, tripled donations. They use it to this day to kind of like showcase like the power it has. And that's been very edifying. Even I'm here after all these years, Yeah, it's the, it's the one thing people want to talk about because they want to talk about it because it was their first VR experience and they just feel like they're doing what they're doing because of that. And that's a very beautiful thing to, to still hear after all these years, you know? Me too. I mean, I, that, that experience is clearly deeply impactful for anyone that has gone through it and especially being so early on adopting this medium. Um, there was really a blank canvas. Nobody knows what, how, what to tell a story in this way. And, and you, you really, you and Chris really kickstart the, this, this medium for so many storytellers that continue to use 360 as a medium yeah. today. Um, and of course, now we have more sophisticated way of telling stories with CG, with full room scale uh, environments. So what was that journey then after that project that led you to create The Last Goodbye, which clearly I, I'm also still feeling it viscerally, um, yeah. walking through yeah. that gas chamber with the Holocaust survivor, what the, the piece that we show, showed in Davos. Um, but, but that creative process, please share with the audience. Yeah, well, you know, I, I got some demos of the yeah. HTC Vive. Yeah. And, and I remember thinking, oh, like this is, this is fascinating. But it felt very game-like. And I wasn't yeah. sure how it would translate with my, my work yeah. and what I wanted to do. But I, they kept saying, think about it. You should be thinking about it. You know, and 
And I think people, what, what's really touching with what we do, or what I, I've been able to do is people with new technologies come and are like, can you do something meaningful? Like tell a meaningful story with this new technology. Because that's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. So magically, yeah. Bose, yeah. Um, you know, even this is really my new project here. Yeah. It really is people like, like this is being used for this. Uh, because a lot of the, the dark field stuff, they use for horror and entertainment and everything. They haven't done a docu type of thing. And I think it's like trying to understand where it can be appropriate and work. And so, yeah. um, so I looked at the HC Vive and I didn't think there would be anything until I started um, exploring photogrammetry. And then yeah. I said, yeah. I was like, whoa, photogrammetry has yeah. become a lot easier to do and you could layer things. And there's a company I think called Realities IO yep. in we Berlin. Yeah, we invested in them. Yeah. 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 And so I've seen, I saw some of their work and I was like, okay, now this is photo real and this is fascinating. And then I was really thinking, okay, like if we had a, like a blue sky thinking, like how would we be able to make this feel all photoreal, which is a challenging game engine because yes. of fidelity, processing power. And then we were able to kind of hack away using a stereo capture, building CG shoes, doing a little bit of like a magic trick almost where you feel like you're there. You feel like you can walk around the gas chambers, the camp. You feel like you're walking alongside this amazing person telling you the story who's a survivor. And I said, okay, we're going to do this though. It's only because it's, it's going to be so expensive yeah. and it's going to be such a high level thing. And I wanted to do it on the Holocaust because I had done, I had done something on Gaza. And you know, when you do something on Gaza, you get a lot of things of like, well, do something on the other side, you know, do something about Israelis or something like that. You know, and I love Israel. I lived there as a kid. I have a lot of friends who are Israeli and they loved that movie on Gaza. Like it hasn't, it wasn't what they thought it would be. It's always the human side. It's not political. It's just shedding light on like our collective tragedy of being human sometimes of like what's there. And, um, and I just said jokingly, I said jokingly, I said, I said, don't worry, I'll do something on the Holocaust. You know, it's kind of an inappropriate thing to say sometimes, but, and they were like, oh, that's fascinating. It's fascinating. They're like, okay, well, maybe we can connect you with like the Shoah Foundation. Yeah. And the Shoah Foundation yeah. is, is founded by Steven Spielberg. Mm. And so I met Steven Smith at a meeting in, in the UK because I was there. And uh, he had, had seen Clouds Over Cedra. Yeah. And he was a huge fan. Yeah. And he was just like, wow. And he was, I guess, you know, Pincus, the survivor, was in England at the time too. And right away, he just was like, we're going to do this. And then you're just going to have to meet Stephen Spielberg and uh, just convince him. But it should be fine because you're doing, this is amazing. Like, a concept is great. And I had already kind of um, started shooting some tests and footage and things. And so then I met Steven Spielberg and I pitched him. Uh, and he was like, yeah, this is great. Let's do this. And they, you know, funded and backed it. And we were able to kind of just do amazing things, you know, um, that allowed us to push the boundaries of what, again, VR could be, that it could be our, the holy grail, which is you walk around and it is like reality, you know, it's photo real, you know, and it was an a incredibly edifying thing. And then they, they preserved that experience um, as the first sort of digital VR product that's part of their archive for testimonies. Because all before was video, you know? So this is their first VR one that is going to be there for future generations. And they are, they put it on the Oculus store. They continue to have it in museums and exhibits. And the actual photogrammetry of those camps is now extremely, it was the first time it was done, right. is extremely right. important. And you know that Notre Dame, yeah, they had course. done yeah. the, that photogrammetry that yeah. after it being burned, and I hope no one does anything to concentration camps. Who knows, like, what history, how it's going to be written, what it is. But having these kind of scans is, I think, really important. And is being used for education in different ways, you know, where you bring those in in curriculum and other ways. So, no, it's been an amazing experience. And then, you know, from there, that was what we continued to, to do and had done things for the Nobel Peace Prize Committee for ICANN when they won a Nobel Peace Prize for 
nuclear proliferation. Mm -hmm. So we did something on the Hiroshima Peace Memorial. We worked with them to develop something about Hiroshima um, survivors, and it's very beautiful, called The Day the World Change. We then did something to counter Islamophobia, focusing on Sufi music rituals. It's a social, like, VR experience that was at the Abu Dhabi Louvre, was at Sundance, was acquired by Dog Wolf, and the first VR documentary to be acquired at a festival. Um, and then we've done things with Magic Leap. We've, you know, around the eviction crisis in America. And now, yeah, and this one touches on relationships and, and, and this sort of scourge of intimate partner violence and us thinking it's just other people or it's not our problem. But we're all like, when you go through the experience, you realize there's a spectrum and there's all something we can do to reflect on our own behavior in a safe way and realizing that, you know, there's more to it than we can think of. And it's been very, very, very interesting to see the reactions here at South by because, you know, you know, it's been very, very, very powerful to see that. And it's been great to get that feedback and see what we can do. And yeah, it's, isn't it a blessed life to be able to tell these stories and work with these things? We have an NFT project, of course. <laughs> That's a, that's inevitable, but again, they want me in that space, right? Because they're like this. This is a, a meaningless space. Give it meaning, you know. And I always joke with Barry, you know, meaning is the new money. I say that because we, I don't pay him a lot of money. No, I'm joking. So we got to fix it with meaning. But uh, it really is like I think people are like, again, coming together to solve a very hard problem of how we can use smart contracts how we could use data and blockchain to kind of like rethink empathy and, and philanthropy within like this space, you know, and how there's so much you can do now that's, you know, bringing in different things. I'm very excited by that project that, you know, has a really great team of people behind it that hopefully we'll have in the next couple of months. Tell us more, or is it not oh, no, time no. yet? It's, it, it basically is, um, there's, there's data around this, in America, that every minute 20 uh, intimate partners are assaulted, um, and that's about 10 million a year. And so the idea is um, that we have a digital work of art that we, it's kind of based on some of our assets of our poster and the world we built for paradise, and it slowly degrades at that rate um, if you buy it. And to regenerate it, to have it not completely pixelate and, and degenerate, you have to kind of collaborate with others to have them embed their value within this NFT that increases its value that when it's resold, you know, the proceeds go to support people in these sort of things. And then your artwork regenerates and is not pixelated. So it's a constant reminder that if you don't do anything, there's a kind of loss that's always happening that's affecting all of us in some ways. And so it's about building blockchain oracles into the blockchain of data and it's an artistic interpretation of that data within an artwork that then builds a kind of community aspect that gets people to then collaborate to 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 work on this issue and you know a lot of ngos all compete for one pot of money you know and are not incentivized to collaborate uh, and at the un it's actually a big problem especially like what's happening in ukraine um, let's just say the refugees are all in Poland. You come down and you realize what happens when a disaster happens is the church comes, the NGO comes, this other NGO comes, and they all are like trying to help. And they're all doing the same thing and they're not coordinating. They're not coordinating. And one of the biggest roles of the UN is to coordinate all those actors and make a coherent strategy. And that's what the UN can do with its authority. But it's always very hard because they'll say, that they need to be the one showing that they're doing it so mm. that they can get the donor money. Right. Right. It's right. a very sad but true mm -hmm. thing. Reality. And with blockchain, you can mm. make it that if they create an NFT with a partner organization, mm -hmm. they both could get more money mm -hmm. because there's something in the incentive structure that collectively people would realize that that's what they would want to invest in because you are, like in a contract, are showing your collaboration and can show that you can raise more money, you know? So those are like really fascinating things that this new technology could do that could change the values and the default problems we have in like the way our society is set up now with its incentive structure. It's realigning incentive structure through Web3 that can, I think, 
change how people think about art, but change how people can think about what these can do to enhance collaboration and impact. And we're very excited, and we've talked to, like, very... There's a hunger for this. There's a crazy hunger for this, you know, because it's not getting uh, the attention it deserves right now because it's being about the same 2.0 values of celebrity drops and, you know, I'm, I'm on social media and I, just, you know, I cheat people of like getting these things, you know, like it has this kind of thing that's, there's a lot of negative things in the space, but the actual technology, if you start coming up with new use cases and developing something which we're doing and I'm grateful to do, and honestly, it's all my skill set of going into game engine because it's Unity, it's creative coding. A, you know, it's a lot of those things that I have. I realized I was like, wait a minute, the time is now. I can build this team tomorrow. I know these people. And that's been like why it's been more incredible because there's still a high bar barrier to entry because it's easy to do an open C type NFT sure. that's just, you know, 40 PFP. megabytes, whatever. But if you want to do something generative, interactive, right. multiplayer, absolutely. Whoa. Yeah. Like now things are going, but that's no different than how hard all of those other game engine projects were. In fact, it's kind of easier uh, because it's a different UX, but it's harder on some of the smart contract you know, part, but not hard to find if, you know, I'm who I am and I talk to people, you know. Uh, I don't know if you met um, Lex, who was in Davos with us, yes. who was part of LightChat. Yeah. Lex um, is now at Consensus mm -hmm. in the UK on mm -hmm. FinTech, and he's a a, you know, he's a big Good part ally. of this part. Yeah. yeah. So he's just like, um, he's like, I've been telling you this is going to happen. Like, you know, that you're going to come into this world. Because he's, you know, he was telling me about this for years with NFTs and everything. And, but he was like, you're, you're figuring out a very meaningful way. You're carving out your, again, it, it's that same story. You're taking a new technology and trying to see what you can do for, for it being both artistically beautiful which is very important for us. We're aesthetics driven first and impactful and great. And to be honest, we're more, we're more into the, the beauty of something, you know, because we think we're artists, you know, but figuring that other part out is so interesting. Those two things, there aren't a lot of people that do that because, and then bringing in the technology side, which I think makes it have different emotions and I think really does something for the tech sector. It gets people to think about technology in ways they wouldn't have otherwise. And that's why we are so edified by all the support and really excited for that. This new project, amongst all the other things we are doing. It's, uh, it's extremely inspiring, but also to have such a consistent narrative of your life's work to converge all of your skill set, vision, passion um, in the way that is artistic, technologically advanced, that does good for society. I think very few people get to live a life with such consistent narrative and continue pushing that envelope have you ever come um to moments of any doubts any self-doubt any <laughs> question marks about whether this is the path because from the outside i mean it sounds like perfection and such an enviable spot everybody yeah. would yeah. love to live a life like that with such impact and consistency yeah, and i go on the red how carpet been, i go to yeah Kong, exactly you know I, it's like how it's the high it, and low you know what are the vulnerable moments uh well you know i wouldn't wish it upon anyone because I think it's a very, very stressful and tough life because you're basically living on the edge of where people have not un don't really understand what you're doing and there isn't necessarily a market market for it. You know, it becomes like these festivals or there'll be in museums. With this app of Paradise, it is thankfully an iOS and Android app, but we, we, we there we we have very low margins, you know, like we basically, you know, put all of the money into making something that doesn't exist. So right. it's, it, it's not, it allows for a lifestyle to continue because I teach also and I, I have a lab. I kind of combine it. I don't do commercial work that often. Right. I do it sometimes. But generally, like, it's like no one is just saying, hey, Gabo, you're so amazing. Here's just like money for your studio and you should just like, of course, like you, you've, you've shown, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. It basically is like yeah. project based and then we just start all over again and you have to then pick yourself up and like 
get on this, you know, like, and it's really hard. And I thought about investment, you know, right. but then I'm not trying to consciously make money out of what I do in a capitalist way. Like, I think it's important. I think there could be a business model around what I make and do. And this, this Paradise app is $10 per couple, right? So there is like now hopefully some revenue. We're always thinking of that. But quite honestly, it, the moments are, of doubt are really like, how much do I have it in me? I have a family, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. I, and, yeah. I, and, and they're extremely proud of me, though. You know, they're really, really, really happy for me. And they don't want this to end, you know? And so there's a lot of beautiful sacrifices that you're, you're, you know, my wife, my family make to make me do this. So the moments of doubt is like, you know, I could have been a very rich doctor, you know, in New Jersey with three Honda Accords or something like that, you know, <laughs> but, but instead I'm, I, I live in a rent regulated apartment in Brooklyn, you know, hustling to take my son to public school all because I believe in this work. So those, th the doubt is when you realize, am I, how will this sustain itself? Yeah. You know, what will yeah. I have to do next? Um, and how do I figure all that out? And I, I, to this point, it's all been the blessings of other people. And I've just been so grateful. And you kind of reach that self-doubt. You're like, okay, can I even do anything else? Like, what would I do? Because I create my own opportunity. I cr I, it is all my vision. I don't want to hear all of my work. I, I have final cut. I don't like to hear other people's opinion about things. Not even Barry's. Well, Barry, he, he counts. You know. <laughs> okay. But sometimes I do override him a lot. Um, but that's okay, Barry. Uh, but I think, so like when you want to have total creative control. Yes. And you take people's money. There's a small Venn diagram of people who are crazy enough to do that. But they do it. Yeah. And I take it. And then I'm like, this is like, I can't believe I'm putting 80 to 90% of this into the cost of it. Right. And then sometimes you lose right. money on it. Right. But I was right. like. I'm like, so maybe I should, you know, like in high fashion, they have this sort of like business model yeah. where they like the show run, the walkway at fashion week is the most expensive, impractical thing, but it captures the attention and imagination and your vision. And then they sell t-shirts and like little key rings that actually make the money. Right. So right. we've always been like, what's our t-shirt? You know, what is it that like we can do that can sustain these very like expensive crazy projects you know nfts nfts maybe 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 i'm doubtful but maybe maybe there's a platform for social impact nfts i know there's some that exist already but something yeah maybe there's something that makes that sustaining because it just feels like if there was a way to like connect all of the work i had done to something that made them feel more permanent because of blockchain or something that they could be transferable into a metaverse. They can, but they're going to still require a lot of work. Right. Put them in. Right. Um, I think if that starts, then yeah, we're very well placed um, to do it. Um, you know, we're into immersive learning, Barry and I as well too, and Lightshed. We do trainings um, and we're like masters at that. We've done a huge project with Accenture on racial bias that has shown oh. incredible work using AI and a lot of different things. We are... Are, are very keen to think about uh, in in at the lab in Hopkins. We have an Air Force grant to work on soft skills, mm -hmm. um, you know, to deal with bias, to deal with sexual assault, and other problems that the Air Force has, and working with them and doing it. So, you know, there is something that you know we are thinking how how do we take what it is. But I'm I, sorry, I'm I, it is there is moments of self doubt. It does take a lot of strength. I again don't wish it on anyone. Because I do think it requires super human, like sort of like resilience and strength. And you know, you get knocked down. The pandemic. I mean, Jesus. All my pro. I had two projects that I had to start. I had to question, like, I can't work. What do I do? I can't do any of these things. And then you're like, what can we think of that's going to be exciting for us? And so we did this one with immersive sound. We have something with computer vision that we're looking at. That's even browser based. We trying to expand what we can think about. But we do, what well, I'm very happy, our next project is going to be in VR. Um, and it's a merger of 360 and using the footage from the Snapchat spectacle. 
Um, which That's why we, yes, Larry's filming us yes, now. Yes. Okay. And and it's with the ballroom scene in Baltimore, which okay. is like a, the transgender community that kind of uses like dance and everything for community and everything. So we're really excited to come back to our roots and to do that. But no, it, it, it's an everyday sort of thing. I, I think for anyone, I'm sure even for you, uh, we're all having moments of self-doubt because for we sure. don't know where the world is going. We don't know where this technology always is going. Yeah. We feel like we might be left out. We might not be able to be relevant. Um, and then we're not sure how it can actually be a sustaining business model. You know, and a lot of those things have not solved themselves. But again, I just feel being relevant and alive in this space is just like the most satisfying thing I could do with my life. I can't think of anything else I'd rather be doing. You know, it's a real honor and a privilege to be able to do it. So as long as we can sustain that through whatever way we can, we'll continue to do it. And one day if it ends and it doesn't feel possible, then we had a beautiful run and we made some difference in the world. And we had a lot of fun, and we'll see how it goes. You know, I think um, I'm hoping it's just the beginning and not the end. It really takes incredible amount, a level of conviction in in this vision, and really incredible amount of optimism in humanity. Really, despising a lot of heavy and difficult problems and stories that you want to tell, but it really takes really quite the opposite. You have to be an extreme optimist to really stick to this path that is otherwise pretty difficult. I really appreciate you opening up with me. I don't think we went down into this level of uh, vulnerabilities and personal feelings, um, even in Davos. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that we're having this conversation. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, you think about what transforms you yeah. in your own life. Yeah. And um, a lot of it can be art and stories, you know. And so I think that's the optimism I have is that even though it's coming through the new technology, it's really the story that is touching people and then the technology is kind of enabling new emotions or engagement with it that is giving people new insight and a perspective on something that they wouldn't be able to have otherwise so it's a really um that's the optimism that you just realize that if you do it Mm. because it's so story driven and stories are the most fundamental dna of being human you know it's like the thing that's how we create and pass on our legacies yeah that's how we communicate that's how we build our values, yeah. you know, and yeah. to use the canvas of new technology means that we bring humanity to that technology because stories are just what it means to be human. And, you know, we, we always have these cyborgs like combining humans with machines and they turn into cyborgs, but it really is combining storytelling with machines that actually make things useful for humans, you know, and, and, and make them see that there's different ways that we should be thinking about these technologies that are not as exploitative, not for war, not for like selling you something you don't need, really truly for personal transformation. And that new technology is like an amplifier. It's just like steroids, you know? If you get it right, the right mix, you'll totally transform somebody forever. I do believe that. And you know that for some yeah. of the experiences you've had. You're like, yeah. I'm, I'm not the same. It won't, and, 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 the, and how quickly you can do that and how effectively with measured change because it kind of interacts with your, your neural um, biology, you know. And this new experience, you know, it's very, uh, it touches on something very personal to me also because my sister um, was in an abusive relationship and was able to, um, you know, she was maybe 35, she had to leave her, her husband in India and come here and seek asylum with my mother. And she had two young girls. And a lot of it, you know, I, I saw she went to the, she discovered the public library and she came back and she got this book called, and she's very, you know, she's very like more traditional and Indian, you know, because of my background and, and my family's more traditional and Indian. And I was younger and I was born in the States, so I'm a bit different. Um, she got this book called Self Esteem for Dummies. That was the first book she got. And I was like, wow, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. there was like always mm-hmm. something about a lot of her. Her, a lot of her is in this experience too, you know, and I really, yeah, I encourage everyone to download it, check it out and, and to do it with an intimate partner and, and see, you know, how we can kind of, again, see how this builds a different sort of relationship and transforms us to hopefully be better to each other because that's all we have is each other. Especially, especially after this, this time uh, yeah. of so much yeah. physical isolation. 
um, it really we all come to the reckoning how important our physical interaction and human relationships are yeah. to us. And yeah. like you said, eloquently, that's everything we have, and we. Yeah. We desire to use metaverse and these different technologies to create a sense of presence and share memories, co-create new experiences. But ultimately, I feel that all of that, even in how amazing and uh, all inspiring those digital experiences would be, ultimately, the purpose is to inspire all of us to be more keenly aware and grateful for our physical reality. There's a, there's a binary that people put of real and virtual. and. Yeah. You know, Jaron Lanier is amazing yeah. about talking about you go into that other world to then look at this world yeah. with fresh eyes. That's right. You know, and that's right. It's true. It's yeah. true. I, 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 he says, he, as a test, he says, um, do VR and then have someone put flowers in front of you after they come out of a headset. And he was like, you look at those flowers in very different ways, right? And it's, it's that kind of thing where what can we do? That brings us somewhere. Yeah. That when we come back, we make this world, um, you know, better. A better one. A better yeah. one. And and I think um, art and culture and so many things take you away and then bring you back, and you are never the same. And I think that's why storytelling with with new technologies is so important. Yes, of course, industry, enterprise, all of that. Mm -hmm. But as I tell mm. my students, I said, you know, in the near future. If I had any say, if I ruled the world, uh, I would have immersive storytellers in all companies and all disciplines, the way you have now people who do, you know, PR communications. Because I think immersive storytelling is what makes it again have that aesthetic sense, makes people understand narrative, and everything's a story. Every product is a story, you know. No doubt. Steve Jobs, you know, like, he understood that, and it was important to kind of. Make people realize that that skill is relevant in everything. You know, Chris Milk is obviously really, really close still, and he's an amazing, amazing person. Um, has created a product called Supernatural, which is for fitness, I love it. right? Yeah. And um, and he gave an interview recently because he was acquired by Meta, and he said more artists should make products. Yeah, yeah. You know, because yeah. it's a story. It's that will make it better, and because he's an artist. That is a really, really good product that so no good one looking. else, yeah. no one else could have made. Absolutely, you know, and that's why it's effective. That's why it's powerful. That's why it's showing results. So we have to start taking artists seriously, like, and giving them the opportunity to build products and to think of their skill sets in ways where they can really flourish and thrive and create a culture that allows them to feel invited, you know, and to feel. That they have a place because we would absolutely transform so much of, of tech at least if those people were not seen as just being on the fringes you know or, or a niche thing you know but at the center at the, the center, center of, of everything at the center of telling everything. the world stories yeah yeah i look forward to seeing the gobble product <laughs> <laughs> as a follow-up point <laughs> for the next episode thank you so much gabo and barry for spending some time with us and catch up I feel that like this was really a perfect excuse for us to catch up. <laughs> so this was almost like a publicized version of our <laughs> private catch up. But we, we went into a lot and I feel I am often just left speechless and really inspired by your com conviction and, and your vision. Um, and I, I'm sure all those that are listening feel exactly the same. So where can people find out more about Paradise? Uh, they can go to thisisparadise.app and download it on the iOS or Android device. Uh, and they can go directly into the App Store and search for Darkfield, Dark which is our partner mm -hmm. and platform that we have launched this experience with. And uh, But everything is on the website also about NFTs and other things that you can do and how you can download the experience. So this is paradise.app. And in the App Store, you can search for Darkfield, the Darkfield radio app. So I, will, I want everyone to go download Paradise from their iOS and Android stores and uh, experience um, Gabo's magic of storytelling in the impactful way to humanities and relationship, um, but in, in this instance with your intimate partner. So great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. <laughs>